is which they already uh, they all already teach. So so that's what I plan to do tonight, and hopefully. I'll be able to do that in about 30 to 35 minutes and then open up with uh, for questions uh, from from the audience. Um, so what what is uh, SFL uh, language pedagogy It's based um, is based on SFL theory and the wh what is taught in writing is the genres and language. And that's what it makes this approach to writing a little bit different because of the heavy emphasis, emphasis on language uh, teaching because it came from a linguistic theory. Um, then the other aspect is the how. How do, how do we teach uh, writing? And it's done through what it's called the teaching and learning cycle that was developed by the linguists and educators in Australia uh, that started using this theory in the schools. And I've worked uh, in a school in Boston for 10 years with the teachers and made our own, we made our own modifications uh, through what we learn in, in the application. And um, and the approach is what I call an apprentice approach uh, to teaching uh, writing. So the students are very, it's very Vygotskian in form and the students are really sc scaffolded by experts uh, in, the, in the process of learning writing. And, and together these two make what is called as the SFL uh, pedagogy. Um, so the SFL was started, uh, was developed by, by Michael Halliday in, at the University of Sydney um, in Australia. And it, it's, it is a linguistic theory. It's context-based. Um, the, at, at, the, at the heart of, of the theory is that the unit is the text. So we all we work with the basis of the text and not just isolated words or, or isolated sentence. And this text is, finds itself in the context of the culture where the use of language or on writing, since I'm gonna emphasize writing, but it can be applied to anything. Uh, um, and the context of the culture is what gives us the genres of writing. It also, ex the text also exists in the context of situation. And the situation is what gives us the features of, of uh, the register. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And I always clarify when we talk about culture, it's not about food or clothing or whatever, it's how, how the culture expresses meaning through language. And in and in in the case um, that I'm talking now is through writing. Um, so, um, so the the five key aspects that I'm going to talk about is that one is the units of writing that we develop in in the schools to teach and coach the children on writing are based on the genres that are embedded in the content of the curriculum. So it's not something separate. Uh, so uh, for, and, the, the, and the genres are here I have, and I, I compare this with a common core because the common core has only three text types that are, that are too big and too, too vague. So SFL, has a much more detailed uh, analysis of text because the structure of, and the language differ among themselves. So what the Common Core calls narrative is actually a bunch of genres like personal recount 
all of the historical genres like biography and autobiography, and then fictional and narratives and all of the forms of fictional narratives. And the common core just clustered it into one. And what they call information and explanatory actually is reports and, and then seven or eight types of explanations. And there is a little mention on procedure in the information. And then we have arguments and there are different types of arguments. So, so the pedagogy is, is, starts uh, with, with a genre. And as I said, th these genres are embedded in the content. So for instance, here I give you an example of what a, a, a planning with a fourth grade class. And this class had to te teach about voting rights. So the students uh, wrote arguments uh, about uh, a policy that needed to be enacted. They, they had to learn about innovation and innovators. So they wrote biographies about different people who had brought innovation for the world and so on. So, so the writing is just not separate, but it is, uh, it, it, the writing really enhances the learning of content. Um, so, uh, and, and the other important thing in, in SFL is that it uses precise meta language. I often hear the teachers talk about or oh, write a good beginning, a middle and end. Well, it doesn't mean anything for the children or for the students to say that. And by the way, I, I always say children, but actually we, we apply this. I've applied it even with my doctoral students. Um, uh, so it's, it, it can be done through the ages because it's just that the level of difficulty changes depending on the age. And, um, so, so for the students, it makes more sense that you say, well, if you're going to write a procedure, at the beginning of the procedure, you have the goals and materials, then you have a series of steps, and then you may have an evaluation or a commentary at the end. If you're doing a biography, then you start with a orientation, when, where, and what, and then um, the record of events, and then the significance of the person. That is much more meaningful than the beginning, middle, and end. And so um, SFL is, it's, uh, and, the, and the pedagogy of SFL, the meta language and the precise meta language is essential. And, 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 and teachers don't have to be afraid uh, about using the meta language with the children because they learn it and then they can talk about language and structure if they have the meta language. So that, so that was my first point. The second point is very important. And that is language is about choices that are defined by the situational context, by the register. So language is not about rules. So that's the way, you know, I'm old. So that's the way I was taught. Uh, so, um, so the text, the, the language choices that, that we use to write a particular text um, is, is depending on the topic of the text or the field as the as a failure scholar, the tenor or the audience and voice, um, the mode, whether it's oral, written, multimodal, or the medium, whether it's a book or a poem or a PowerPoint. All of these things play a role in the choices of language that, this, uh, that the students are gonna make. And then the role of teachers is to build those language resources so that they can uh, be, the students can be, make effective choices in the language uh, that they use for the text. So if they are gonna write if they're going to write about metamorphosis, you know, they need to know the language that allows you to talk about metamorphosis. And, and you need to know who are you writing for to decide whether the language is going to be uh, in, in a, a first person or third person or formal or informal or whatever. So, so 
the choices so the there are no correct things. It all depends on the particular situation that you make the choices. And the, the genre also helps you make choices. And then when you have multilingual students, they also have to make choices uh, in the language or languages that they're gonna use. So you see, so this is a very important that the context of situation it, it should, uh, is the one that um, gives you the signal of what is effective language for a particular text. Um, so, so the third and very important uh, point, which is really, that's why the theory is called systemic functional linguistic, is that a language is taught for its function. Um, I remember when I started uh, working at the, at the Russell School, um, there was a, a Latino older teacher who was about to retire and then she decided to stay three more years just to work with me because she was very intrigued about this theory. And, and she was the type that started, started the day teaching kids adjectives, you know, or things like that. But it, the, the, it wasn't related to anything. It was just a part of speech. Well, in, in, in systemic functional linguistic or in the SFL pedagogy, you teach language for its function. So when you say three teaspoons of sugar, um, the, the important thing is not that, uh, that three is an, is an adjective or of sugar is, a, is an adjective, but that you're giving precise, you, that you need those adjectives in order to give precise instruction. Um, when you're writing an argument, you're trying to buy uh, uh, the acceptance of the reader and, and convince the reader to what you're arguing for. So you say, if you're arguing uh, for how good a book is, you talk about the extraordinary book. So you use an adjective uh, in this case, positive language to convince your reader. When you say peaceful afternoon in a narrative is to give a description. And when you say electrically charged particles, electrically charged are adjectives that, that give you an accurate description of those particles that are so, in, the accurate descriptions are so important in science. So, so we teach the, the kids the language for its function and not just a plain part of speech that you do for 15 minutes and then forget about it. Um, so our, our, the fourth key point is the, the approach to teaching that I was um, telling before, which is an apprentice approach uh, to teaching how to write. Um, so the, the, this is the modified teaching and learning cycle based on my research with teachers and work with teachers for the last 15 years using uh, this approach. And, 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 and the cycle starts by deconstructing text. That means if you want to learn how to write an argument, you work with the, with the students looking at arguments that an expert writer has done. And, and you look at what the purpose is, how, what are the stages or how is it, it is structured. You know, they had some background and it had a, a thesis and it will have reasons backed by evidence and they will have a reinforcement of the thesis at the end. And you look at those things in the text written by an expert. And then you, can, you also look at what kind of language the expert uh, uses. Um, the, the, in an argument, the voice is signaled by a lot of grammatical elements. So for instance, a statements are, make for more, for stronger and more 
uh, um, uh, assertive arguments. Uh, first person is more familiar than third person. So you look at how, who the audience was and how this, uh, what is the grammar that this uh, writer used to express um, the, the point of view about what uh, she or he is arguing. So you look at every aspect uh, but in, in repetitive cycles. So one thing at a time sort of thing. Then, so this is what you learn from an expert. Then these two other steps is what you learn with an expert. So this is when the students plan their work with the teacher and write something as a whole class and so we use, we use a, a graphic organizers that are helpful uh, for the particular genre. So I have different graphic organizers depending on the genre. And, and so the teacher and the students plan together and then they write together. Uh, so there is always a class piece that comes together. When the kids are very young, that might be what you end up publishing. Uh, and, and you do the work that way. When, when they have become more mature and, uh, uh, and can begin to write uh, themselves, then they, they go into writing individually or in pairs or in groups, we can do it different things. We always have the students, even if they are writing individual papers to work as groups so that they support each other. So we consider that a very important part of the cycle. And then when they develop drafts, we teach them how to um, revise by doing, by taking one or two students um, drafts or chunks of, of their drafts and revising with, with the whole class for those aspects of the genre and the language that we've been teaching and that we think are very important. So, so we do that together and then the students can do it individually or with a partner. And then, the, then that's the, and, and, the second opportunity to publish. So we usually, uh, many of the teachers, no matter what grade level I work with, they do, they, they do the, two, the two kinds of publishing. So by, you know, by the time the students have done one with a whole class, they've developed such confidence in their ability to write. They do a much, uh, better work uh, when they work in, individually. And I've had teachers that have decided to even start from the research uh, process, because in order to write, you have to know. And so one way of knowing the content uh, of what you're going to write is by doing research in the topic. Remember, I showed you, for instance, that the students were studying about innovation and innovators, and they were going to write biographies. Then, in order to write the biography, they had to write, uh, do research in the people that they're going to write about. So, so the research to build content happens all the time. It's, it's, it's ideal to do the writing on research that they have to do for a particular content area so, uh, so that the material uh, has already been worked on and they will get to work more as they are writing. So it happens. And the other thing that has to happen is the teaching of language and the teaching of language has to, uh, happens all the time. So we start very early on to teach teaching especially key aspects of language. For example, if I'm, if I'm doing a unit on report, we teach 
how to create complex noun groups because reports have all of the information in noun groups. Um, for example, you don't talk about a python, you talk about the three feet articula uh, reticulated python or whatever, something like that. So it's, uh, it's complex. If you're, if you're writing uh, arguments early on, we teach the kids what is called the evaluative language, a positive or negative words that I showed you an example. So uh, mean uh, person or um, extremely intelligent classmate, you know, so, so positive or negative, depending on, on, on the point of view of what you're trying to, to argue about. Uh, so we start teaching language from the very uh, beginning. So my, my uh, motto is students are taught to write and not told to write. I mean, when we went to school, you know, you, you studied about um, George Washington or whatever. I studied about San Martin or whatever because I grew up in Argentina and then and then they tell you, okay, write a biography. So you learn about the person, but nobody taught, to, taught you how to write a biography. Uh, so I always say, and, and, I work, and I work very hard with content area teachers, you know, to say, don't tell the students to write unless you've shown them how, uh, because it's just not fair. Um, and so that's a, a major, uh, premise of, of this approach uh, that if you are asking ki kids to write, no matter which content area, you have to teach them how. Um, um, so, so I wanted to briefly show the difference between this approach SFL and the most more common approach that I found in many schools, which is the writer's workshop. And I, you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, I was the queen of the writer's workshop. And the bilingual teachers kept telling me, it's not enough. It just doesn't work very well with the kids. And so when I found SFL, I was like, where were you, where were you all my life? You know, and I started in earnest. Uh, working on it. And, and the big difference is that in SFL, the teaching is upfront, heavy duty teaching upfront, as I just showed you. And only then you have the individual writing. And so the revision is, 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 uh, is less intense because you have done a lot of teaching upfront. Instead, in the writer's workshop, you would just give a, 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 a mini lesson, a quick mini lesson, and then tell the students to write. And then you would do revision at nauseum and the kids get tired and they get frustrated. They don't like to be revising what they've made a great effort to write. Um, so, so, um, so that's, you know, and, and, and the focus, of writer's workshop was uh, uh, specifically on the process and that's fine. But the, 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 fo the focus of the SFL pedagogy is in, it's on the genre units. So teachers know where they are going. That's one of the things that teachers told me that they can demand uh, on the students because they and the students know what is where they're going. They know that they start with a purpose. They know that they go on to teach each one of the stages of the genre. They know that they have to teach all these language uh, features that are gonna help the kids make meaning. And, and so they, and, and they know that they can do it over an expand uh, 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 time so they are not rushing into it. They are really practicing a lot and also learning content very thoroughly uh, in the result, 
uh, as a result. And, uh, and so they have, they feel that they have a lot more direction of, of, of where they are going. I always had the impression that when I went to schools and watched the writers workshop that the teachers just, you know, pull a, a lesson out of the sky and then decided to teach it and apply it, but it wasn't part of a whole. And, and, and this approach has been phenomenal with bilingual learners because it, of the emphasis on language and the emphasis on scaffolding and, and working with experts and working in collaboration. And the other thing that we do is that we allow the kids or we encourage the kids to use their native languages as well, to learn, to communicate, um, and, and to discuss and to even and to express themselves if they want to uh, write in their native language, that's fine, you know. Um, so um, so we found it extremely useful for that population. But I use it with entire schools, and and everybody uh, does it, even. Um, you know, the, even the special ed kids, I've also ha had those teachers uh, teach. Uh, and and it, it really, the special ed kids, ed kids build a lot of confidence uh, in their writing uh, as, as well. So, um, so the last point that I wanna, wanted to, to make, and you know, I can, uh, speak forever, but I rather uh, answer uh, questions, and that is um, um, the 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 mental texts that we use are, are used to learn how writers uh, structure texts and use language, and not to stimulate writing topics. Um, my experience, especially with middle and high school teachers, that they cannot detach themselves from the books that the kids are reading in, in, in English language arts uh, to promote writing. And let me show you what I mean by that. So uh, for example, I was working with a, with a group uh, yesterday and we were deconstructing uh, uh, this text to learn how biographies are written. So this is, a, so this is the beginning of a biography about May Jamison. And we looked at the whole biography, but here for the uh, sake of time, I'm just gonna look at the beginning. So the way I would use this mental text would be, for example, uh, to show uh, features of the structure. So the, at the beginning, the introduction of a biography, excuse me, um, includes what is called the orientation. So the who, the where, the when, and then the theme that is going to help tie in all of the events of the biography. So we looked at this and I asked and, and we discussed uh, where, where can you find the who? So May Jamison is the who. Where can you find the where? Well, she was born in Decatur or whatever. I don't know how to pronounce that, Alabama. And then when was she born? October 17, 1956. And then can, I, I asked them, can they find in, the, in this beginning, uh, some information that will give us a clue of what is the time uh, theme of, of this person's life. And it became obviously that scientist was the, the clue. And you see, and the rest of the text is all about her career as a scientist and eventually she was um, the first uh, African-American woman to go into space. Uh, so uh, you can also look at features of language. So for instance, one of, one of the things that in narratives you have to teach kids is the past tense. So here there are um, 
a number of examples that allow you to, uh, to teach different forms of the past tense. So you could isolate them, uh, group them by the type, get more examples and things like that. The other that is typical of historical genres is introducing uh, uh, paragraphs with adverbials phrases of time. So as a child, after high school, and then there are some more in the text as follows. So, so, so the use of mental text is to learn how a writer writes biographies. It is not to promote topics. So for instance, when I asked a teacher, how would you use this mental text? She told me, well, I would use it for students to write um, uh, uh, an, an imaginary or imagine themselves as if they were an astronaut and write about the day in the life of an astronaut. Or I would have them write a realistic fiction where the character is Mae Jameson and, and, and you get to go to space with Mae Jameson or something like that. So you see, this, this is really response to literature is not is is telling the kids to write but it's not teaching them to write because here she she's uh, is requiring them to write an what is called an empathetic autobiography that means that is about uh, an autobiography in character as if you were somebody else's and here she's asking them uh, to write a realistic fiction, and she hasn't taught either of them, okay? So, so and this is what is typical call, called teaching of writing in, in schools, and, and especially middle and high schools, but even now in, in the programs, in the reading programs for children, you have this sort of stuff. So the kids are told to write, and they are not taught to write. And the mental texts are not used for the sake of teaching a genre and the structure and the language, but for promoting topics of how to write. So the problem with that is, is not only that the kids are told to write and not taught to write, is that they are not taught to write original pieces. So in the SFL approach, you are taught to write original pieces. And if we are claiming that we are doing all of this in order to get kids to go to college, they ain't gonna do very well in college if they don't have, know how to write original writing. So, uh, so in the SFL approach, kids do research in the topic they're gonna write. Kids learn how to write in the genre they're gonna write. Kids learn the language that they need to write in that topic and in that genre. So, so that is teaching them to write. This sort of stuff is test taking techniques. And we actually teach this sort of stuff to the students right before the high stakes tests come because that's what the tests do. And unfortunately, the, the tests are, are teaching our, our kids the worst of, 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 of writing. So anyway. Maria, uh, yeah. I wrote a question in the chat box and I, uh, since we were just, you were just talking about that, um, one of my thoughts is, and I love that you made the response to the, um, the good point about the response to literature as opposed to teaching writing. And I, and I completely agree. And I've seen that so many times I couldn't say, but I'd like to know how, um, you, oh, I wrote reach, but teach your students who simply duplicate the mentor text format and language in their own writing. Well, how do you deal with that or handle that in the process? Because, because the mentor text is not in the topic that the kids are writing, you know? It's just it's the genre. The, it's in the genre. So for yeah. instance, this mental text, I recommended it for the first time, and then I've used it a lot because it's great. One of the features of the mental text is that it's simple and short. 
um, and and uh, I used it for a teacher who had to had to get the kids to write about explorers in the 16th century. So there was no way that they could copy from this one, you see. But they learn how to write by dissecting in depth this text. Um, so yeah, so. Um, and, and actually one of the things that the teachers have told me is that when they do research, they have the kids take notes and then they have them put away the research resources. That way they don't copy the text directly. No. Okay, thank you. So uh, I have a, a couple more things and I'm gonna go through them quickly because I've gone a little over my time. But the other thing that I wanted to point out is I, I hate the, the, the word accommodation. I, I totally hate it. Uh, I think we should give the kids the opportunity to excel as much as they can. So we, we, we encourage them uh, to write and, and do the best they can rather than limit them what they, what they do. One of the ways of um, uh, help uh, kids with different language uh, abilities or proficiency or, or age and maturity is by the choice of genre, by the aspects of the structure and language cover, by the type of grouping of students that you do, and by the choice of medium. And let me show you that quickly, and then we can deal with all the questions. So for instance, these, these are the narrative genres that are not fictional. And, and I show you how they are different in level of difficulty. So, so in the early grades, you would do personal recounts. And then for instance, Later, you would do biographies. Much later in the grades, you do historical recounts or empathetic or biography. They are all different types of narratives, but they get harder and harder. So that's one way to deal with level of maturity or even level of, of proficiency. Um, the, the other way is to choose the amount uh, the structure or the language that you're going to teach. So for instance, with argument writing, for the early grades, we only give the kids the thesis or claims, and they have them look, we have them look for reasons. We don't have them look for uh, deal with evidence uh, until second, third, or, or, or above. So that's another uh, way uh, to deal um, uh, with, with difficulty. Um, the other is by grouping, as I mentioned before. For instance, this, uh, this piece was written together by a group of substantially separate preschoolers. And, and so they were four years old and they wrote with a teacher and they would come. So the teacher had, for instance, is how to make lemonade. The teacher had the word cut, and then they would come and write the C, you know, um, and 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 uh, so add some some letters and stuff like that. But then this four-year-old, she's also a four-year-old, uh, decided she was going to write it by herself. She was not in this class. She was in a, in, a, in another class, uh, mostly bi bilingual kids. And so she, write, she wrote herself, I cut the lemons, um, squeeze the lemons, um, pour water into the pitcher. How about that for pitcher? And um, something about sugar. Uh, I think I add, yeah, they, they always do the B instead of the D, add the sugar. Okay, so she wrote that by herself. So different kinds of groupings uh, allow you to uh, work with, a, with the levels of maturity and, and proficiency. 
and the other is the medium. So for instance, uh, in, in argument writing for the early grades, we have the kids do, for instance, letters ba just based on a text. So this text is about a kid who's about, a cr about to crush an aunt, a an aunt, what, no, how do you pronounce it? Aunt, I think. And, uh, and so, and so they, the kids write, take the side either of the kid or of the aunt and they write a letter, but they have all of the reasons and everything in the book. So they don't have to be running around doing research as uh, in, an, in this early grade. And then in third grade, uh, also we write letters or brochures, which are easier as medium. And, and later you can write advertisements or posters, um, or letters to a distant audience, not in media, not, and then essays. So these increase the level of difficulty. So the medium allows you uh, to deal with also maturity and proficiency. Okay, I'm done. And you can ask questions. And I guess I'll stop the share. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, very interesting thoughts there. Uh, Nikki, would you like to ask your question since it was the one that just popped up? Hi, yes, just on that last slide when you were talking about the medium, um, I wondered how was how is medium different from genre? Because you were talking about letters and advertisements and brochures, and I would classify those as genres. So how is medium different from genre? Right, right. Many, many people call those things uh, genre, but uh, but in SFL, you 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 call uh, a genre uh, something that has um, a purpose and a structure uh, that is consistent uh, throughout the different um, types that you write, uh, and and you can you can do it through any medium. For instance. Uh, uh, if you write, if you were writing a fictional narrative, it can be written as a picture book. It can be written as a PowerPoint. A ballad, which is a, a poem, is also a fictional narrative. So um, a letter, you can write a fictional narrative through a letter. So the 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 structure and the language. Uh, they find the medium and not, uh, they find the genre and not uh, the medium that you use to, to make it public. Uh, but a, a, a lot of people uh, in general sometimes talk about those things as, uh, as uh, genres, but um, you, you you can't say, you, you say that most narratives are written in past tense because they tend to be about the past. You can't say that you, you always write a letter in past tense because it's going to be depending on what's in the letter. Um, when you, so when you're teaching or you're presenting that model text, then the model text is going to be a particular genre and medium that you want the students to replicate? It's in a particular genre, and in, in the medium you can you you can choose it uh, at, at some point, and you would analyze uh, uh, examples of that medium and see what are the uh, the structural features of it. So, for instance, when a teacher decided to uh, do have the students do reports in the form of a poster. She taught them uh, what is the content and the structure of report by reading by reading reports, and they were writing on animals. So she read a lot of uh, books that uh, or or short texts that were reports on a particular animal. But then they walked around the the school looking at posters and seeing, you know, posters have a lot of images. They have little language. They are grouped this way, that way. But it didn't have to do anything with the content or the structure of a report. You see, so you have to actually teach both. Thank you. So it looks Thanks like um, Ying has a question for you. It's in the chat box. Ying, would you like to ask? 
Hello, can can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, I cannot show my face because my kids are around. So, um, <laughs> I'm, so used to, I'm used to teacher teaching, uh, taking their courses with the kids and the dogs and everybody else is <laughs> like online all the time. So yeah. Right? Okay, so I work in the uh, teacher training program, and I, I personally I love this approach. I read uh, books, uh, and I, I I learn a lot in uh, this approach. I I really like my pre-service teachers to learn this, but I I I tried um, in my course, but I find a lot of them really don't have a very strong linguistic background. It's kind of difficult, even. Sometimes even when I mention adverbial clause and they have no idea. So do you think um, teachers do need a certain linguistic knowledge to be able to embrace this this approach? Yeah, no. well, you're right. And 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 uh, when I started working with the teachers, uh, I always win them by talking about the purpose and the structure of the genre that they get right away and it makes a lot of sense to them and then i slowly start working with language so i don't have them teach a linguistic course teach a linguistic course but i start working with language and what i do is i take the most important aspect of language for each genre that we learn so for instance right now i'm teaching a course on all the types of narratives so verbs are crucial for narratives because verbs, one is that they, you have to teach the past tense and all the forms of the past. And if you have second language learners, a mess. And the other is because verbs expose the characters, expose the people you're writing about. And so the students need to understand that if, uh, that they have to, uh, write like so and so um, battled over this idea, you know, or uh, and things like that, so that you get a sense of what the character is going through. So verbs are essential. So in this course that I'm teaching ab uh, about all forms of narrative, that's what I work on intensely. I work on on verbs. And also, as you mentioned, the adverbial phrases, I work with adverbial phrases of time because in history, those are very important other way writes the, the students write and then, and then, and then, and then. And so in the morning, later in the afternoon, when my father walked in, all, this, all those phrases, we, we, we steal those phrases from books and write them down and learn them and stuff like that. That's you don't need a whole linguistic course uh, to do that. So if you so I grab into the things that are essential for that particular genre, and then when I go to another genre, it'll be something different. So so as they go along, they will pile up their linguistic knowledge. But language is always the one that everybody's insecure because we don't teach very much language in in schools. To me, was always I was always amazed when I came to the States and I had colleagues in literacy who knew nothing about language. That, that floored me completely, but anyway. But you have to do the language. But I, I totally sympathize with you. Um, so it just started slowly. And, and when I started at the Russell, I did a purpose and stages for like two years before I started pushing them to do the language. Once they learn about the language, then they say, then they, I mean, they themselves told me, you, you have to push it from the very beginning, uh, you know, so they themselves realized uh, what a difference it makes. And the Australians went through the same thing. Uh, in the first uh, years, they only emphasize purpose and stages, but the, but the writing plateaus, if you don't teach language, the writing doesn't get better. So, so uh, do it slowly and, and do it very targeted with what's the most important for this particular genre. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you asked that question, Lynn, or Yin, uh, because um, 
you know, I, I, I struggle with the, the lack of uh, linguistic wherewithal of our, my pre-service students, and I'm working with literacy and uh, TESOL and bilingual students, um, and I wish they were more aware of it, but I, I, I'm really glad to hear, uh, Maria, when you said that you know, you're looking for what's present within the writing or within the material to teach them um, and to have the teachers highlight. And that, because that's my approach that it's just look for what's present in the piece. So that makes me a lot more comforted. Thank you for that. Yeah, and, also, <laughs> and also what is gonna work with that particular age, because for instance, at one first grade teacher, I said, all I want you to do is teach the kids how to use verbs other than went. You know, kids <laughs> write a whole story and use the verb went 10 times. So, so that's all he did. And the writing got a lot better because the kids talked about drove and run and skipped and whatever and made the narrative a lot more exciting mm -hmm. and more descriptive. Mm -hmm. You know, so just, and then at the same time, when I work with uh, the doctoral students, we do, I have them do an analysis of theme and new information, uh, their, their texts and the texts get a lot better. But that's, that's something that I couldn't do with kids until they are in sixth or seventh grade. Right, uh, right. So, so, uh, so, so you have to also choose not only for the teachers, but for the kids. Um, were there any other questions? Did anybody else have any questions? I actually had another question. I was just trying to type it if I can. <laughs> I don't want to monopolize though. Other people had questions. No, but um, you have a good question. I was curious about, um, you mentioned uh, about language being um, the, that how how the role of choice and how choice was really important and making language choices and I wondered if you could talk more about that because I think sometimes when our students have lower levels of proficiency they don't have you know much range to choose from right. and so could you talk more about that element of choice and um, in helping students to um, develop their choices um, when they're when they're trying to write Right, right. That's a great, that's a, a great and very true question. And that's why when I talked about choice together with that, I said, well, the, our role as teachers is to develop their language so they actually have choices, you know. So, but, but the, the reason why I say choice is important, because you don't want to have the kids um, think that there is only one way to do it and, and no choice. Like like one, I remember one science teacher got got tired that the, the kids would write these science reports and they would never name the, the objects or the animals or whatever they were writing about. They would just use pronouns, he and they and it and things like that. So one day she said, no pronouns, that's the rule. So, so the kids would repeat the nouns again and again because she didn't allow them to write, her, you know. So no, you, 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 you choose when you, when you write the, the actual noun and when you can use a pronoun. And the, and the important thing is that the pronoun has a referent. And, and, and you're thinking about, it's not because there is a rule, it's because you don't want to confuse your reader. So you, and you're thinking about your audience there too. So, so, so you choose the noun or you choose the pronoun to make it clear for, for your audience. Or, you know, uh, when, when I told the teachers that, that the use of third person makes um, uh, makes the arguments more assertive. So now they want the kids to write only arguments in, in third person. But, but there should be a choice because if, I, if the kid is writing a letter to their parents to let them go on a field trip, 
they're not going to write on in third person. They are going to write in first person. It makes sense. That's that's a logical choice. Um, so so the the context of situation, the audience, and everything else makes you choose the the the, the type uh, of language. Mm -hmm. uh, and so and so that's when when you notice what they do is that when you build like the example I just said, you know, we with a first grade teacher, we were noticing that the kids just use went all the time. So I say in order to to for them to have choices, let's let's teach them how a bunch of verbs that could be used instead of went mm -hmm. uh, so that they do indeed have choices. Mm -hmm. um, but but you're right. Uh, the, and and then the other thing that I didn't um, that I guess I mentioned some is the choice they can have is to use their their native language. I just worked this spring with a six, seven, and eighth middle school ESL teacher who had all newcomers. Uh, uh, and she decided that they were going to write autobiographies. Well, autobiographies are super hard to write. Any narrative is super hard, and we think it's the easiest thing. In terms of language, they are the hardest thing to write. And, uh, and so she, she used both languages. She knows in Spanish. And she allowed the kids to use both languages. And so, and so they chose. And, and some of the kids uh, used more English, others used more Spanish independent. So that, that was a way to deal with choice uh, when they were very much uh, beginners. Mm -hmm. But they, they develop a lot of confidence and, 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 uh, and many of them did, did try to work uh, in English to the extent that they could. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. You've um, really give, given us all a lot to think about with this. Um, I am really excited about applying some of the concepts to a multi-genre project I've got my students working on. So it'll be interesting how it informs um, that research project. Um, but anyway, uh, on behalf of everyone here and on behalf of the teacher educator interest section, Thank you thanks so much for spending this hour with us, Maria. We, we are very grateful. I just um, want to share, share for a minute that I do teach three uh, one credit four week units in, in the different genres. So if anybody oh. is interested in knowing more between that and my books, you can have. And there is a lot of other SFLers who have worked on this. So excellent. Anyway, excellent. But thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Kate. This this was a fun opportunity uh, oh, to be. You. I wish I could be in person with all the TESOL folks that I miss from not going to the conferences. Right. <laughs> right. I guess we'll be back this year. Um, it'll be a uh, first time in a while. So hopefully everything will go well with that. Um, would it, I had some requests from some of the attendees to have copies of your handouts. So would you, if, would you be willing to share those with us? Uh, sure, just let me know how I can. Uh, you just, if you wanna send it to me, um, I will send, make sure they get sent out to the attendees. Oh, okay. I yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, have a great night, get some good sleep. <laughs> it's a late time for you, so have a good one. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, bye, bye everybody, thank you.